Moses climbs Mount Horeb and begins to inspect what looks like, no, it is, a burning bush, a tree on fire. But it does not wither and it does not smoke. It does, however, speak, and the voice of God bellows from the inside of it with a call to action. Moses, Moses, here am I, the erstwhile prince of Egypt says, and from that moment on his life would never be the same. The ministry of Moses had begun. But that's not all that happened at Horeb. God gives God's self a kind of name, I am, of course. But more importantly, God reminds Moses, and therefore us, that God sees the struggles of his people and has remembered them in what can best be described as God's heart. I see and I remember, God says, effectively. Earlier this week, I saw and remembered something painful. I was struck and haunted by the words of the head coach of the NBA's Los Angeles Clippers, Doc Rivers, when pressed by the media to respond to the NBA player's impending strike in protest of the treatment of black Americans. Coach Rivers, like the professional ball players, was reacting to the senseless shooting seven times by a white police officer of an unarmed black man Jacob Blake, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, this past Monday. Coach Rivers said through tears, We keep loving this country, and this country doesn't love us back. And so we see in horror again as a wrongful shooting terrifies and enrages the black community and its allies in America, and the cycle begins anew. Peaceful protests, yes, peaceful protests, which are then co-opted by looters and rioters who take advantage of the situation. Much of white America becomes frightened, and then we hear the demands for law and order. Soon the situation metastasizes into a political situation, them or us, and we escape to the political sides we've chosen for comfort to hear our own echoes Hooligans and thugs are destroying our suburbs. White nationalists are loosed onto the streets as fully armed vigilantes. This happens over and over again, as it did earlier this summer, and will happen again and again, until something in our bones changes us, and until justice really is delivered. Who feels like they can scarcely remember 60 years ago the passage of the Civil Rights Amendment, or even just 12 years ago the election of our first black president? Feels like someone hit the reset button and all of that racism solved sensation seems like an old pipe dream. And somewhere, perhaps in a pillar of cloud or a bush on fire, God weeps and says, I have observed the misery of my people. I see and I remember. As much as we feel like we are in a loop, a cycle of injustice and polarized responses, particularly on matters of race, we must realize that this is nothing new from God. God who entrusted the earth to humans and only asked for love in return has watched for millennia as we squandered that gift and that promise, only to be washed out to repeat the process all over again. God has had plenty of opportunity to move on, find a different chosen species to rule the planet in peace and harmony, love and equity. Maybe it's another galaxy at this point, who knows? I cannot for the life of me sometimes figure out why God keeps coming back to us keeps extending loving arms, keeps encountering us at our most unsuspecting, our most vulnerable, and gives us another chance. In Exodus, God sees and remembers the enslaved people, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who through bigotry and hatred have been subsumed 
into slavery in Egypt, a sworn enemy. They are the oppressed in this part of the story of Earth. They are the ones disenfranchised and asking why Egypt can't love them back. And Exodus will culminate in the parting of the Red Sea, the miraculous opening of a pathway across dry land for ancient Israel back into their homeland, back to safety and prosperity, back to the promised land. It's easy to see why on this week's anniversary of the March in Washington, why black Americans like Martin Luther King spoke of their struggle in terms of bondage, deliverance, and the quest for the promised land. Like Moses, Dr. King would never reach that promised land. And like our black friends and family in this country right now, it feels like the promised land is a thousand years away. God encounters Moses in this origin story of sorts on Mount Horeb, which is also known as Sinai, in spectacular fashion, the famous burning bush. The voice to the would-be prophet proclaims that he or she remembers the enslaved peoples and bucks up Moses to be the voice to speak to the power, the imitable Pharaoh of Egypt. But before that even, there is the verse that please remove your sandals, for you are on holy ground, holy ground, sacred ground. If you read in our newsletter this week or perhaps saw the introductory video from presiding Bishop Michael Curry, you will know that sacred ground right here from this passage gifted us today is the name of the series on race and reconciliation, which we begin next month. It is intended for white or mostly white congregations just like us in the Episcopal Church, a hallowed, sacred space, and a place to confront and face the realities of racism, such as the fact that we have inherent privilege based on the color of our skin. Through no fault of our own, and many times without a hateful bone in our bodies, we must, must reckon with the fact that we benefit from our whiteness and the resources and privileges that come with that. From better access to stronger school systems or job opportunities, to living in areas where there is no violence, which, by the way, is why white America is so afraid when there is social unrest potentially coming to their neighborhood. To something as almost imperceivable as being ignored by police as we take casual strolls through our neighborhoods and our city streets. The truth is about Jacob Blake and the situation stemming out of Kenosha is that we don't know the whole story and may never know the whole story. You have and will hear rumors. Did he have a knife? Was he resisting arrest? Was he abusing a girlfriend? We will search for the reasons why a white policeman will fire his weapon seven times into a man's back in front of his children but we may never be able to confront the simple truth that in a split second, a white man was afraid because of the presence and perhaps the behavior of a black man. And he reacted in horrifying ways. As a famous John Grisham novel, A Time to Kill, asked of a white jury about a young black character at its center, now, imagine he's white. Police don't seem to shoot white people who are there to de-escalate a tense situation or who happen to have a knife in their glove compartment or floorboard or who have their children in the back seat. Though the sacred ground on top of Horeb is a chance for God to wipe the slate clean and build back humanity into relationship, for Christians, we still hold this intention with the unequivocally pacifist point of view of the incarnate God Jesus Christ, millennia later, violence begets violence, something our Savior was willing to prove quite literally when he opened up his loving arms on the hardwood of the cross to end the cycle of violence and injustice. But that's a tall order to ask even our Lord, and therefore it is a tall order to ask of black America to do for us all. 
but how blessed, how blessed are we that with cameras and smartphones, we are able to begin to see the world as it really is broken, fragile, systemically racist. We can see the injustices on a tweet or TikTok or a viral video, but will we remember? The Exodus story begins with a call and then a declaration that our Creator sees and remembers those in captivity, those in pain, and those suffering. God sees the people's suffering, remembers, and then enacts a plan to do something about it. We must stake our hope on this truth that God will do something about our current situation too and we can only control what's in our reach. So for us, for people who like it or not, are the people in power and may be considered the oppressors, maybe we need to continue to begin at the start by changing our own heart. Maybe we who participate in creation like God, who wants us to participate in that loving act of creation, maybe we can hope to learn to see and remember like God has done, is doing, and will do so again.